So, okay, welcome to this part of the course, which is about uh, the C11 threads. Let me start with uh, some background about this stuff. So, basically, the, the, previous, standard, <laughs> the previous C standard, 98, basically does not acknowledge the existence of threads, but this doesn't mean that you can, of course, you cannot use them because there are other possible ways to do multi threading, of course, in C, even if not, uh, let's say, uh, native. Uh, multi-threading, but basically you can do that using OpenMP, for example, Boost, or maybe using a different frameworks like Microsoft Foundation Classes. Then with the, the new standard, with the C11 standard, the multi-threading support have been, uh, has been introduced, which means that now you have basically all the components that you need for thread management, for shared data protection, for synchronization, and, and also other stuff. The standard basically, that, Let's say that doesn't specify how the threads must, must be implemented. And this means that basically they can be built on top of an existing multi-threading library, which belongs in particular to a given system, a compiler, and so on. And this is particularly the case for GCC, because in, for this implementation, we have the C11 multi-threads basically are based on P threads. And this is also, let's say, clear if you look how you. If you look at the compile line that you have to use basically to compile your code, because you have to add, besides the C11 flag, also this minus p thread flags, basically. OK, let's start with the basic building block of this, uh, of multi in C11. Let's say that the, most, the first element that you need for, to do multi threading in C11 is represented by the thread class. That basically is a class that represents a thread, a thread of execution. So, this is a first important distinction. One thing is the class, the STD thread that represents the thread, let's say, in an ab ab abstract way. And then we have the thread of execution that you can imagine like something like the physical thread that is running on the, GP on the CPU, for example. So how you, how you can create a new thread? Basically, what you need is just to provide an initial function to the thread that must be specified in the constructor of the thread. So if we have a look to this small example, here in the main function, we are, we are creating a new thread object using this constructor and passing as an input parameter to this constructor this function, basically. This is a very, let's say, easy example where the initial function just to print out this hello world string, of course, but this is the first example, and this is in general how you should create threads. Basically, you create a thread of execution by providing a, a kind of task, something that the thread must, be, must do, of course. And this is the first example. So, I have a first question here for you. Here we are in the main function, we are creating a new thread and executing a new, uh, let's say also creating a new thread of execution, providing as task this hello function. And my question is here, how many threads do we have in this main function? Yeah, exactly. We have two threads because the first thread, of course, is the thread <laughs> which, uh, which corresponds, of course, to the execution of the main function. And the other thread is the thread that you, you have created the, there with the hello function. Another important thing that you have to, to see here is that at, at some point we make this call to the join method of the thread object, which basically means that we, here we are asking to the, to the main thread, to the thread that is making the call to the join function, to wait here for the, let's say, for the execution of the task assigned to the created thread to be completed. It's something like an OpenMP barrier. Somehow, okay, you are waiting for the new thread that you have created to complete his work, and you wait for his, for his, for this job to be done here. After that, the job is completed. Basically, the the thread is said to be no longer joinable. Basically, if you have a thread that is associated to a thread of execution, which means that basically the thread is doing something with the task with the task that you have assigned to it. The thread is said to be joinable, and you can check, check if, the thread, sorry, if the thread is joinable by making a call to a function that I forgot to put here. Yeah. In any case, there is a joinable function in the, inter, in the interface of the thread object that uh, returns a, a boolean and tells you if the thread is still associated to a thread of execution. In this case, the boolean value is true. Or if the thread of ex execution is, is, is completed, basically, because the task is finished, and in this case, the thread is no longer joinable. So this is the main difference, basically. 
So how is the interface, the general interface for the thread constructor? I reported the, here the, the signature of, the, of this constructor. Basically, you have two parameters. We have a first parameter, which is a, a callable type in general, which corresponds to the task that you have defined for this particular thread. And this can be basically a function, can be an object with a, that provides, an, an, a, let's say, a public parenthesis operator, or maybe also lambda expression. Basically, this is how you define what is the task that must be performed by your thread. And then you have another set of parameters. Here we have a parameter pack, which is basic, based on this variadic template that correspond basically to the set of input parameters that you want to provide to your callable object, basically. So that if you are calling, if you're providing a function with a given set of input parameters, basically, the set of input parameters must be provided in the same order to the, to the constructor of the thread object. But then we will see some examples for this. Once that you have created a new thread with an associated uh, task, let's say, you have to decide what to do with that thread at some point in your code. Basically, you have two possibilities. You have one, the first possibility is to call the join method, as we have seen in the first example, which basically means, OK, I will wait for the thread to complete its job before going on. And the second possibility is instead to call the detach method, which means that, OK, I don't care about what the thread is doing. I will just put it in the background of my system, and I will continue with the execution of my, of my, let's say, of my main thread. In this case, if you call the join method, basically this is a blocking function. So you will stop there until the, the thread has finished its job. If instead you make a call to this detach method, this is not a blocking function. So it means that basically you can continue with the execution of your thread while the other thread is basically put on the, on the background. This means that the, the thread object, the standard class, the instance of the class, of course, is still there. But basically, the, con the corresponding thread of ex execution is lost. It's still executing on the background, but you cannot access it, access it anymore, basically. And if you try to make a call to this method, which is the joinable method I was telling you about before, it will tell you that uh, the thread is no longer joinable. Basically, you, there is no way for you to communicate with the detached thread of execution. <laughs> You have always to make your choice here. If you want, to, you have to decide if you want to, want to join and wait the thread or the touch. Because otherwise, when at some point the thread that you have created, they will call is the structure. Because, for example, you are in, at the end of your main function, like this, in this point. Here, at some point, the, the structure of this object will be called. But in the structure, there is a check about the joinability of, the, of your thread. And basically, if you have not making, made your choice about join or detach, basically uh, an exception is thrown. So you have always to decide what to do, basically, with your resource. So how can you pass uh, the arguments to the function that you provided as task to the thread? This is a very easy example, but I think it is quite clear so that you can see how things work. Basically, here we are creating a new thread, T. And we wanted to, let's say, to this thread to perform the task which is described by this function f. You can see here the list of input parameters. Basically, what you have to do is to provide the set of input parameters for this function in the constructor of the thread in the same order. It's quite easy, right? This is not the only way, of course, to pass the argument to, to your thread, basically. But there is one important point uh, to discuss here, because uh, basically the input parameters that you are, you are passing to, your, to the constructor of the thread basically are, are always passed by value. So this is a very important point, because if you want to do something like that, here we have uh, an instance of the class x. You create a new thread, and you want basically this thread to perform the task described by this function here which makes a call to a generic set method of this class. Basically, this is a non-const method, so that you want uh, that your thread modifies the status of the, of the passed object, basically. If you, have, if you are working, let's say, in a, with your main thread, you can make a call to this function by passing, uh, in, let's say, in a standard way like this, uh, the instance of the thread, the instance of the class x. And since this is, uh, with the signature, we are taking the the input parameter by reference, at the end of the function, your input parameter will be modified. If you do the same 
with the thread this is not happening because basically the, the constructor is always taking the parameters by copy. So that if you really want to modify your variable, the variable that you are passing in input to the parameter, you have to specify this using the standard ref call, which is something that I think you yeah. talked about this in the morning. Okay. So this is the main mechanism. If you, if you want to really pass by reference, your variable to the thread constructor, you have to, uh, basically you have to say that explicitly. Because basically every time the thread is working with an internal local copy of all the var all variables that we're passing to the constructor. There is also another possibility for, let's say, for not for passing arguments, but for defining the task in this case, which is represented uh, by this case. For example, you, are, you have still this class X, you have the same method that we were using before. What you can do in this case is also provide a pointer to this method as a task to be performed by your thread. In this case, you have also to pass the pointer to the to the instance of the of the class that will be used for this task by the thread, and then the input parameter as usual. So, this is another possibility to call your uh, to create a new thread with a specific task. So, what about the resource ownership? What if we try to do something like this? See, sorry. Question. Yeah. So in, in that example, when you pass the address of the object, you're making a copy of the, these pointers. So you're actually changing x yeah. when you go in the, in the thread, right? Yeah, yeah, it's something like saying standard ref here, basically. Yeah. Oh, another thing, very quickly, yeah. is std ref is basically returning a proxy to the object. It's a kind of application of the uh, proxy path. Okay, what if we do something like this? We have a function which always describes the task, the generic task that we want our thread to perform. We create a new thread which will correspond to a given thread of execution with this task, and then we make, we create a new thread using this, const this assignment operator which basically will try to call the copy constructor. Can you see any problem in doing this? Except for the fact that it will not compile, I mean, from a logical point of view. Here we have a problem, of course, because if we think about the copy constructor here, you will have uh, one thread, the first one, which is associated to a given thread of execution. Then here we are trying to create another thread that basically will try to use the same thread of execution. So, of course, we have a problem because at, at some point you will try to maybe to call join on this, on this thread instance. I will try to, or maybe to detach the first thread from its thread of execution so that basically the resource will be lost. And so for this reason, basically you cannot do that and the threads are basically move only object. They are, let's say, somehow equivalent from a semantical point of view to the unique pointer. You can only have one thread that is uh, the owner of, a given, of the resource, which is in the, with, that in this case the resource is of course the thread of execution. So the copy constructor and assignment operator are deleted. But you can still move, of course, the ownership. You can just, you have just to use the move semantics so that basically you can do something like that. Here we create a, a new thread, like in the example before, with the same function, f. Oh, if this is wrong, it should be f, OK? Then here we create a new thread. In this case, you are creating a kind of, let's say, empty thread. It's not associated to, to a given resource. It's not associated to a thread of execution. Here you use the move semantics and basically move the resource of this object. So the thread of execution of T1, you move that thread of execution to T2. So that basically you can do something like that. You're moving the resource from one object to another one. And here, basically you cannot do something. Oh, this is a question, of course. Basically we cannot join T1 after that we have moved the resource, of course, because T1 is no longer associated to, a, to the thread of execution that uh, originally was uh, assigned to it, basically, at constructor time. I think that should be T1 join. Where, sorry? The comment No, it is another point here, because the question was about uh, if, uh, yeah, I forgot the question, basically, so. <laughs> The question is, okay, at some point, let's say that at, 
Here, basically, we have lost the control of the thread of execution because here we have just one thread of execution, which was moved from T1 to T2, and then here we call T2.join, which means that basically we want to wait here for the thread of execution to be completed. Now here we created two new threads. The question here is, now I call T2.detach, can I call here T2.join? This is the question. So the, the answer, of course, is that uh, after that you have called detach, you can no longer join your thread because you have lost the control, basically, on your thread of execution so that you can no longer join and wait for the execution to be completed. So do you have any question so far? Yeah, please. Here, do you mean what happens if I move from here to this line? Yeah. Okay, here I'm detaching the, the thread of execution, which means that basically T2 is free, is empty, is no longer associated with the thread of execution. And here, but here we have, I have created another thread, the T1, which is running, uh, which is associated to its run of ex uh, its thread of execution. And here we are moving that thread of execution from T1 to T2. And now T2 is free, it's no longer associated to his uh, thread of execution because we have detached it uh, here. Yes, yes, right. You don't, basically, when you do the touch, you don't care about the execution of the assigned task. So it can be finished or not, but you basically you are not considering that point. And so that here you can move T1 and then call join on T2. You mean if I try to do, if I delete this line? Yes. So that the T2 has already a thread of execution, it is an exception. Okay. Uh, just another information, if you know that if you're using OpenMP, that basically you can have the, <laughs> the, the, let's say, the index of the threads that you are using in your, uh, in your code, basically, there is the call OpenMP thread number or number of thread, thread number. I always forget this, <laughs> okay? In any case, if you're running with n threads, basically you will get a set of number from zero to n minus one, which is the order, basically the index of these threads. You can do something, let's say, similar here, but you are not uh, really getting an assigning int or something like that. You, are, if you, you can only get this type as a type of index, basically which has not a real semantic meaning. I mean, it's something that you can use to, to compare, to see if two threads uh, correspond to the same thread of execution, because there is the comparison operator, there is the equal, equal. But, but basically, if you try to do something like that, this will compile, of course, so you can print this number, but it's something which has not a real semantic meaning. If you, you can just try to do that, you will get some very bigger, strange integer which has nothing to do with the number of thread that you're using in your code. So it's just for, let's say, logging and debugging, but there's not a real meaning that you can use like um, for thread, uh, let's say, recognition like in OpenMP, let's say. Okay, this is everything about this very, let's say, basic, uh, interface for thread uh, creation and, and so on. Then we will move to the next uh, point, which is uh, data sharing. So this is something which is also common to OpenMP, of course. And the question here is, uh, what if I have uh, two threads, for example, two or more threads, like in this case, we have three threads that tries to access the same uh, memory location, the same variable. Let's have a look to this case, we have uh, this main function with uh, two threads, T1 and T2, that they are created and, and they are both associated with the same initial function, which is this update counter, which is defined here. So basically this function is taking an input as, by reference, this variable, IO counter, and updates it. And up updates it, okay. And then there is also a call from the main thread to the same function, so that now we have three threads, main, T1 and T2, that are trying to access in write mode the same variable. And my question is, what is the value after that T1 and T2 has been joined in this point? Yeah. 
Okay, so here basically you have an uh, array's condition, of course, because you are accessing the write mode from more than one thread. And what you need to do is basically to introduce some kind of strategy that allows you to do this operation in a, in a critical block, basically. And you can do that using some of the, let's say, of the facilities that are provided by C++11, and in this case, for example, by this mutex object, where mutex stands for a mutually exclusive, and you can find it in the mutex uh, header. Of course, I, forget, I forgot to tell you that the threads are instead in the thread include, in the, sorry, in the thread header. Okay, how can you use this mutex object to, to, to build basically a critical block around your update uh, operation? You can do something like that. Basically, you have here this mutex variable, an instance of the mutex object, basically, and in within your update counter function, instead of doing just like that, you have to protect uh, this operation, the update operation, by basically calling a lock method and then unlock method before and after the update operation. If you do something like that, this is like creating a critical region here where only one thread at a time can access basically the operation that you are protecting. It's like an open MP critical. Right? This is nice, I mean it works. It doesn't also require a lot of work, but the problem is that you have always to remember to, of course, to call lock and then always remember to call unlock because otherwise you will have just one thread that arrives here, is the first that thread that acquires a lock. It started to make all the operation in the critical block while all the other threads are waiting at the mutex lock call. But then if you forget to call the unlock, you will have the first thread that will continue the execution and all the other thread that will wait forever at the beginning of the barrier, basically. So you have always to remember to do this operation. And since you can forget to do that, basically there is another object, which is the lock guard in the same header, that basically helps you basically to avoid to forget this unlock operation. And it is also an interesting example of application of the right helium in this case. In this case, you have to think that you, have a, you are managing somehow a resource. In this case, the resource is the mutex on the lock. So if you use the lock and the lock method, basically you are manually controlling the lifetime of the resource, which is the lock. And if you use instead this array idiom, you basically you're, you're giving the responsibility to the object that implements the, the idiom, the responsibility to, un, to release the managed resource. And so you can see here how this new object works, basically you have still to define the same mutex variable as in the case before, but here you just need to create this lock guard object providing the input the mutex. So that this object basically will call the lock method on the provided mutex. It, the, thread, the first thread that calls this, that creates this object as the access to the critical part of your code, it will perform all the operation, and then when the destructor of the guard object it will be called at the end of the scope, basically the lock on mutex will be automatically released. So this is exactly the Raihidium concept, basically applied to this new resource, which is the mutex, sorry, the lock on the mutex. So the, basically the lock duration in this case is the same of the, is the lifetime basically of the lock guard variable. So now I have a question for you. Let's have a look to this uh, data structure. Basically, I have just one data member, but it doesn't matter. I have two methods in my interface. One method is work on data, that basically use this data to do something. And then you have another set data method that basically allows the external code to set a new value for my internal data member. The question is, uh, what if I try to use this uh, object, this data structure in a multi-threading environment doing something like this. Here, by the way, I'm creating two threads, T1 and T2, using uh, providing as an initial function a lambda function, which is defined here, and providing the input, basically, the instance by reference to the instance to this, of this uh, data, data structure. And there is one method that will make a call to work on data, so to know this method, and the second thread that on the same instance, which is passed by reference, will, be make, will make a call to set data providing this, uh, this new value. Do you know what is happening here? Yes, I can understand what you are saying. <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. So basically, you have to introduce also in this case a, a kind of data protection to avoid uh, this kind of uh, problem. And you can do that by basically introducing a new data member, which is a mutex, okay? which is so that it belongs to the scope of the whole data structure as the two methods. And you can just make uh, a call to, you can create the two critical region in both methods by creating a lock guard variable instance here and another lock var guard instance here, basically. Of course, this is not a complete implementation, as you can see, okay, as you can read here, because uh, here we are still missing something about the copy constructor, assignment operator, and so on, so that we need to protect the data access also in that kind of, uh, of operation. So what if uh, I introduce another method on this data structure? Let's have a look to this work on data. Now, instead of having just, um, let's say, a list of operations here, I'm somehow I'm doing my work here using two methods, one process data and one write data, which means that process data is something which can be expensive and works on data and so on. And then we have a write, met write data method that basically you know, creates a file with the result on disk. So it means that basically we need, uh, we really would need to protect only the access to the data. We, have, we need to create a critical region only for process data and not for write data because when you're writing the data, the result of our calculation on disk, it means that maybe the other thread, that the one that is using set data, can go on with this work and setting new data it, that, because it's not needed for him to, for, it, for that thread basically to wait for the T1 to finish his work. The problem here is that if we use a lock guard, basically we cannot do that because when you create this instance, you create a critical region that starts where you, the, the instance of a lock guard is created and that continues until the variable is, destructed, is destroyed, sorry, so at the end of the scope of the function. So here you need, let's say, to define a new granularity on your data protection because you will just need to protect to create a critical region only around this process data method. You cannot do that with the lock guard, but you can do that instead with this other object, which is the unique lock, which is still part, it is also, this object is part of the mutex header, and basically it provides the possibility to decide where and when to lock and unlock the method. So basically the syntax is it's quite similar because you create, a, in this case, of course, a unique lock instance here, passing an input to the, data, the mutex data member. Basically, when you do something like that, the lock variable automatically will create, a, will, let's say, take the ownership of the lock on the mutex variable. So here, we are in the same condition of here. We are creating something which is similar, a lock, similar to a lock guard because we acquire the lock on the mutex. We work on, uh, with our process data function. And then we call the, lock dot, the unlock method on the lock object, which is something that you cannot do on the lock guard. So basically, here on this line, you are releasing the ownership of the lock on the mutex, so that basically you are, and basically you are allowing the other thread to go on with his work. So this is, the, let's say, the reason why the unique lock is introduced, basically, because it provides you a bit more flexibility with respect of the thread lock. Yeah? Can you also create a long code? Sorry? Local scope to uh, control the lifetime <coughs> of the lock guard. You could do something like uh, that. You mean creating a oh, in the previous example? Okay, creating a scope here. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think so. At the end of the scope, you will destroy. Yes, it's something equivalent. Yeah, you're right. Could you possibly yeah. also just lock and unlock the mutex manually? Ma yes, you, you can do that. The idea of introducing the lock guard and the other object is just that so you don't, don't have to necessarily remember to unlock the, the mutex. It's just because it is a bit more secure. You don't have to remember to do that. Because if you... So the unique lock would it, be unlocked if you forget yeah, to do it? Yeah, automatically it will release the lock, exactly. Yeah, and actually will work also if you, if you throw exceptions, it will be unlocked yeah. automatically. Yeah. 
a bit of interface of a unique lock. Basically, we have three kind, of, we have three different uh, possibility concerning the strategy. Let's say for the for the, the the ownership of the lock. Basically, when you create a unique lock with the default constructor, you are not providing the set the second parameter. It's, you are making a, a blocking call because the unique lock will try to let's say to take the ownership of the lock on the mutex mutex. But you can also decide to defer the lock, which be, which is basically which basically means that you create a unique lock that doesn't own the ownership of the lock. It, it is just an object that it will allow you the that gives you the possibility to call the lock method at a second time during your execution during the execution of your code. You can provide the try lock try to lock flag, which means that basically the unique lock object will try to acquire the lock, the ownership of the lock, but if this is not possible because the lock is already owned by another object, it will continue the execution, is not blocking basically. And the adopt the lock to uh, option will basically give the possibility to the unique lock to, ad yes, to adopt the lock on a mutex which is already owned by some other object, basically. And oh yes, also for the for the unique lock, it's, it's something like the unique pointer, basically. You have uh, unique lock is a move-only type, so that the copy constructor and assign operator are, uh, of course, are deleted. You have some other method that gives you the possibility to check if the if your unique lock is actually owning the lock or not, so that you have this owns lock that allows you to check if UL1 in this case is owning the lock on the mutex. And this is an important check because if you try to unlock the lock on the mutex when the basically your unique un, sorry your unique lock is not owning the lock itself, basically you will get a system error, an exception. So you have to check if you can do this kind of operation, basically. Just a last slide about this API. Oh, already, I, th I think that I already said everything about that. OK, you have the lock and lock method. Basically, you have the try lock method, that it is something like the constructor with the try to lock uh, option, which is basically a non-blocking call that uh, tells to the unique lock to try to acquire the lock. And then you have this owns lock const method that gives you, if you're already owning with your unique lock, the lock on the mutex, basically. OK, do you have any question before the next session? Can you go on? Yeah. <coughs> what do you mean? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, in a real uh, uh, program, uh, you can have uh, uh, several uh, uh, threads, hmm? uh, even uh, uh, one, two, 200 threads. There is uh, uh, some limitation of the performance of the unique lock. Well, I don't think so. I mean, the, the only, if you talking about performance, there is a difference between unique lock and the lock guard, basically, because you are paying somehow the, the flexibility of the unique lock because the unique, unique lock object needs to store some internal information about uh, the status of the lock on the mutex, which is not something that is required by lock guard because when you create the lock guard, automatically you are taking the lock uh, on the mutex, basically. This is the main difference. Then I don't know if there is some kind of limitation about the number of unique lock uh, with respect to the number of threads that are using them. I don't know. I can. But I can check. I mean, the I don't see any problem. But system, uh, dependent. Yeah. We'll finish the resource, of course. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, what about trying to synchronize two or more threads? Let's suppose that you are in a situation like this one. You have two threads. One thread is using as task this update data function, and the second one is using process data. And the two functions are defined here. They, con they both contain this loop with the same number of steps, basically. And what I want to do is try to synchronize each step of the loop. So basically, that the first I make a call. Sorry, when I when I make when I create these two threads, basically, I want that uh, every time at first I perform the operations that are contained in this loop, and then the operation on contained by this loop. I mean, the first thread needs to do the first step, and then the second thread the first step, and then so on. Basically, I want to somehow order each step 
in the, uh, by performed by, performed by the two threads. So how can we do something like that? The first strategy that we can try to use is basically to use a, a shared flag that we can use to check if the work done by the first thread is completed so that I can start the next iteration of the second thread. Basically, I could do something like this. The flag that is controlling if the work is done by each thread is this wait flag. And what I, want, what I need to do is uh, every time that I make this iteration of the step, I can do my work, I can go on and do my stuff basically only if the wait flag is in the first case is false, sorry, is true. And the, for the second thread, if the wait flag is uh, false, right? And this is the possibility to just to ask the two threads to wait for each other in each step of the operation. The problem is that uh, this, is a, this is a shared variable among the two threads so that both the thread can modify the wait flag here when they have finished their work. And the need for each thread to make a check on the wait flag before continuing his work. Of course, I cannot check uh, this shared variable without adding any kind of protection because otherwise we are still in the, in the race condition. So you have to do that in a protect way. And I can do that by creating this instance of the lock of a lock variable in both threads. Every time I make a check, basically I have to lock the mutex on, which controls basically which protects the variable. I have to check the, val the value of this variable, then I have to unlock my lock just to allow the other threads to do the same, because otherwise I will lock forever the access to the wait flag, basically. And every time that I try again to check the, val the value of my wait flag, I have to remember to lock again to protect the access to this variable. So that within this while loop, basically, I'm continuously locking and unlocking the mutex. But instead of, let's say, of doing that at, let's say, at high frequency without any rest in between, I can add something like this, which basically asks for the thread to wait for a given number of seconds or minutes or whatever before doing the other check. This is important just to reduce somehow the amount of resources that I'm, uh, I'm using for this check, and also for giving the possibility to the other threads to change the value of the weight flag if at some point it can, it can do that because it has finished this work. OK, this code works, basically, but it's not a good solution. It's not a good solution, basically, because we, here we have one thread, the thread that is waiting for the other one to finish his work, that is continually checking the value of this variable, even if you put this this function here to introduce a, a pause between one check and the other one, you are continue to you are using a lot of resources. You are using a, a given amount of resources to check the value of this flag, and during each check, basically you are locking, you are blocking the execution of the other threads because you are owning the lock on the mutex. So the other threads, when you are checking the value of the weight flag, is not able to change the value of the variable itself. And also the other problem is that, uh, yes, you can somehow reduce the problem introducing this uh, slip for a year just to reduce the number of checks. But basically, it's not so easy to define the number of seconds that we have to wait for. It depends on the type of operation that you have to perform within your task. And it's, I mean, you have to customize this kind of operation for every different uh, kind of task. So there is another solution, which is provided by the condition variable flag. Maybe we'll try to explain a little bit here. Basically, this is a variable that gives you the possibility to com communicate between threads the fact that some kind of condition has been verified. So basically, if you use something like that, you can modify your, your function in this way. You have still the first thread that is, that is calling this update data. But now here we have a lock guard that is still working on the same mutex. Here you are doing your operation and that you want to do that you want to be critical, basically. So here there is the serialized part of the, of the execution. We are still using this weight flag variable, and you are still setting the same value for each thread. This thread set the value to false and the other one to true, as in the previous case. But here, at the end of our critical operation, we have that the first thread is calling this notify one function. On the other side, you have the second thread that is using a unique lock in this case and makes a call to this wait method of the condition variable object. This is the same variable which is defined here, basically. And to this wait function, we are passing the lock, the unique lock on the mutex, and another and a lambda function, basically. 
So how things work in this case? Let's have a look to the first thread that is just working on this update data. Basically, the first thread enters in the for, in the for loop, and when it creates the lock guard variable, it acquires the mutex, because this is, this is the strategy of the lock guard variable. It starts to do some stuff, basically, in the critical region, so that in the other thread is basically waiting. It cannot access the same region. He set the value of the weight flag, and then we will see why we need to do this operation. And then at the end of the critical stuff, when, he, when for this first thread is OK, if the other thread start to work on the data, on the shared data, and so on, he makes a call to this notify one method of the conditional variable. On the other side, there is the other thread, the thread T2, that is working, that is associated to an, the thread of execution with this task that the beginning is, locked, is blocked here, basically, because it's trying to acquire the lock on the mutex that is already owned by the first thread because of this lock guard. When this first call, basically, when we, have, uh, when we are at the end of, this, uh, of the first iteration of the loop, basically, all these variables, of course, are destroyed. In particular, the lock guard variable is destroyed, so that automatically the lock on the mutex is released, and the second thread can, let's say, start the execution. It acquires the lock on the same mutex, and it moves to the second line. And it, make a call, and it makes a call to this wait method. Here, basically, are happening two, two things, basically. This method, basically, is a blocking method for the thread that is calling it, and that basically waits for another thread to call the notify1 method. So if you, when the first thread, at some point, we call the notify, met, not, sorry, the notify one method, the second thread will wakes, will wakes up and it started to do another thing, which is, that is the check provided by this lambda function. The return type of this lambda function must be a Boolean. Basically, if the Boolean, the return value is true, then it means that the first thread can, can continue can start to do the, the operation that follows. Otherwise, if it, it is false, basically it will stop again, will release the, the lock on the mutex, and will wait for another call of notify1. Is it clear so far? I know that it's a bit tricky, especially to, to describe, so. <laughs> Does uh, the condition variable takes care of um, sp spurious uh, wake-ups? This is the next information. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. So bef before you answer that question, okay. that notify one, is it waiting for someone to wake up on the other side, or is it just no, it going on? So it, it might be possible that this guy enters in the next iteration, acquires the loop, Yes, and this and is the then uh, it breaks the strict yeah. uh, sequential ordering exactly. that we were talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite possible, and this is why we need uh, this weight flag here because. <laughs> Sorry, just. Uh, yes, your your question is uh, is correct. I mean, this is possible, and this is the reason why we need a weight flag also here. And uh, yes, I think that there is something is missing here, which is like the check on this flag, but it's something strange. Yeah. Well, I have to think a little bit about that, because also I have the example that is working, and I'm quite sure that I need this variable because otherwise this uh, sequence is broken. So. Yes, the, the point is here that uh, when you call the notify one, you will basically will tell to the second thread, okay, hey, let, let's check the value of, uh, of the return by the lambda function, so that it will start the execution. So this is based on the fact that it will, when you start the execution here, because you are saying, okay, notify one with the false value, basically it will acquire the lock. And if he acquires the lock, automatically the second thread is not able to do the other iteration because it's basically blocked here. But, but, it yeah, but the order is not strict. I mean, is if, the, if, the, if the notification is blocking, yeah. then the other guy takes ownership and everything. Otherwise, it would go on. Yeah, so we, what we need there is to protect if uh, waiting for the wait flag to be. It's something like a time uh, interval, yeah. No, yes, you're I'm right. I'm completely wrong. I don't just no, 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 I think code looks I'm like quite sure that you're right because that's the reason why I put the variable here, but 
now I think that I'm miss, still missing something, which is the possibility that, uh, let's say, the, that the, somehow the information from the notify one to the call of uh, this uh, check on the lambda is too slow, so that the first thread has all the time to start another well, iteration. If, if it is the operating system condition variable, it will basically that there are that there, is, there is a queue on the on the on the condition variable and the operating system might actually decide to schedule something else. So, and I don't know, maybe. Well, this is something that I have to check. But in principle, I think that you are right, I mean. And yes, your question was about the spurious wake, and this is basically the reason why we needed to have a wait for a kind of check on a condition here, because otherwise uh, this wait function can be, let's say, called also by spurious wake, and of course, uh, you will have a, yes, a spur of zero's wake of, of the task. So this is the reason why we need to check a condition to see if this is real, if you really need to the thread, the, the thread to start again the execution. And yes, this was my next slide, actually. OK. Yes. Oh, this is another case, but I will skip this one, and I will move to the next uh, feature, if you don't have other question about synchronization. So let's say that conditional variable are quite useful when you want to check, uh, to make a synchronization, like in the example we, before, when you have a kind of repeatedly event that must be synchronized. But if you want just to make a synchronization for a single event, there is another, let's say, another object that can be used for this condition, which is represented by the future object, which is part of the future uh, header. The future object, the object is not a used, uh, let's say, a standalone object. It's always used, in, uh, let's say, it always interoperates with other objects, like the standard async function, the, the package task object, and the promise object that, that we will see in the next slide. But let's start with, the fir with this first case. Basically, when you make a <coughs> the standard async function, is a template function that gives you the possibility to specify a given task to be performed by a new thread. So when you make a call, as we will see in the code, to this standard async function, basically providing a given task, you are creating a new thread that started the, the, the execution of the assigned task and gives you back an object of this type, a future object. The future object then provides some method in its interface that gives you the possibility to check when the task performed by the other thread assigned by the async function has finished so that you can access the result. So basically, if using a diagram, the situation is quite simple. <laughs> Let, let's say that we start with the first thread. This, in this first thread, we make a call to the async function providing a given task f defined by a function, for example. This corresponded to the creation of a new thread, T2, that starts the execution of task f, while at the same time, the first thread can use the future object that is returned by the async function and, can, and that can be used basically to check if the results, or in any case of the executed task, of the task executed by the second thread has completed, basically. When this happens, basically the future is notified and the first thread can access the result of the operation performed here and, that, and can continue the operation. If we have a look to the code, it's also easier because the situation is simply like this. In the main function, we, have, uh, we are using this, this uh, function as a task for the, the second thread that is created. Basically, this is just a function that takes uh, two doubles, one uh, by value and the other by a ref reference. We are checking here, we are changing the, the value, but this is not important, basically. And it returns a, a standard thread ID, and it is just to check uh, in the example of, uh, of the repository that actually this task is performed by another thread or by the thread that called the, the async function itself. But in any case, this is not important. The most important part is here, because here we have that the, the thread associated with the main function make a call to this async function, providing an input to this f task, which is defined here, and the required input, basically. And also this uh, option that we will discuss in the next slide. This async function returns a type, this returns an object of future type, which is template type, where the template parameter is the t same type returned by the function, which represents the task. And then in your main function, you can make a call to this get method, which belongs to the future 
interface, interface which is a blocking function basically that blocks the execution of the first thread until the second thread has completed the execution of this task. So it's quite easy. So what is the general signature of this async function? We have two overloaded two versions basically. The first one is uh, takes an input basically of the provided ta the task that you want to, to be performed by the second thread and the set of argument and this argument pack of course corresponds to the input parameters of the provided function and we have another uh, the overloaded version that also takes an input the launch policy I'm missing an underscore here okay which means that with these parameters you can basically decide uh, how you want the second the task provided here to be executed. You can decide with, between an async policy, which means that basically the task is executed by, another, by a new thread of execution, so it is a, in a concurrent execution, or you can decide to have a deferred execution, which means that basically the task is performed by the thread that makes a call to the async function, and it will, it will be performed only when you will try to access <laughs> the future result. And okay, of course, the async function, as I already told you, the async function returns this uh, object of type future that gives you the possibility to access the final result of your calculation of your operation specified in the function f. Just a bit of information about the future interface, in particular, just about this access method. Basically, with this get method, this, you are, this is a blocking method that blocks the execution of the thread that makes this call and gives you back when it's ready the result of your calculation. And you can check if the, if the future is still associated to a valid, uh, let's say, shared state with the other object, with the, sorry, with the async, with the function on, that is executing on the other thread. And then you, you can also have the wait function that you can also use the wait function that basically is similar to this one to the get function because it is a blocking function that does just waits for the, the async task to be completed. So basically it is almost the same thing. Just a side note, in, in, instead of thinking about of the result of your async operation in terms of, let's say, a number or result of your calculation, it's better to think about a shared state because the result of, of the asynchronous task it can be let's say the result of your calculation, so a number, object, or something like that, but also an exception, in case an exception is, is thrown within the task executed by the asynchronous call. Uh, yes, this is part, yeah, this is already something that I want to tell you. So as I told you, the future is not used uh, alone, it's always used in, uh, let's say, in, it, it always interoperates with something else, and the other possibility is the one provided by the package at task. Package at task is an object that basically somehow extends the idea of the async function, but in this case it gives you the possibility to define your task in an abstract way. And then we will see how. But basically the, the workflow is similar, as I can show you. In the, this is the, the same diagram as before, basically. You have the first thread that instead of making a call to the async function creates this, kind, this object, this package at task object. This package at task object in this interface uh, has uh, some methods that can be used to get a future associated, associated to the package at task, which is exactly the same thing that you can do with async, but with async the future is automatically returned when you make the call to the function. Then you can, when you are, once that you have created the instance of this package at task, you can create a new thread and pass this, thread, this instance of package at task to, this new, in the, to the constructor of this new thread. Because this package at task is a callable object, so basically the thread will, will see it as a, something that he has to do, like a function or a, a lambda and so on. So there is a new thread that starts the, the execution. It will perform the task described by the package at task. And when the, ta the operation, when the described operation are completed, it will send a signal basically, basically to the first thread that is waiting for the future to be ready as for the async case. At this point, the first thread can continue the execution and can access the, f the result of the, of, the perf of, the, let's say, of the operation performed by the described task. The main difference is, here is also that uh, you have to remember that the thread that you've created here is not automatically joined. 
as in the previous case for the async task, so that you have to decide what to do with the second thread, because otherwise you will get an exception, of course. So if we look at, at the code, also in this case, the situation is quite similar. I'm using the same function here, so just have a look to the, what happened in the, in the main. Here we are, cre we are creating the package task object, which is a templated class, was, parameter, was template parameters is the signature of the function f that we are providing as task. So here we have the function that returns this type, the ID of the thread, and takes an input to two, these two double, one by value and the other by reference. And so this is exactly the same signature that you have to put here. And you have to pass it to the, construct, in, to the constructor your task described by the function f. This will not start any, let's say, parallel execution of your, of your task. You are just defining, let's say, in an abstract way, what you want at some point another thread or in the same thread to perform. Here you can already ask for the future associated to this package task, so that here you have a future. Was template parameter is standard thread ID because ID because this is the type returned by the by the task associated to the, your package task. And then here you can start a new thread of execution by passing in input your package task. So here you are starting, let's say, the operation described by this f function, and they are performed by the new thread. The first thread, as in the previous case with async, here make a, makes a call to this blocking function get on the future, and they start to wait for the results of the calculation performed here to be ready, basically. When the, re the results are ready, the, this, this first task can continue with the execution. And of course, at the end of the scope, at some point, he has to decide what to do with the new thread that he has created. In this particular case, we are joining it. Do you have a question? Is it clear? OK. OK, I already told you everything about this here. So the question is, why should we use the package task instead of using the async function? Basically, the idea is that package task, of course, is a, a bit more flexible. You can define your task, your task basically in an abstract way, and maybe pass it to the scheduler for your thread so that it, it doesn't know to let's say to understand the specific operations that are performed within your within your task described by the function. You can just give him the list of package task and ask for the executions. There is a third case, which is the last one, which is for the, let's say, for the usage of the future, which is the one represented by the interoperation with, with the promise object. And this is particularly useful when you don't have a function that describes, let's say, what mu must be performed by the second task. Using future, you're basically, what you have to do is to manually set, uh, let's say, the, the flag that describes the, that the, the task assigned, assigned to the second thread is completed, basically. Also, in this case, from the promises, like for the package task, you can get a future that you can use from your first thread to access the results when the results are, is, when the results are ready, basically. So the situation is quite similar. In this case, instead of creating a package task, you create a promise. From the promise, you can get the associated future. And then you create a, can create a new thread passing as input parameter your promise. Within your second, now at this point there is a new thread that is created that starts the execution. While in the first thread, basically you move to the next step, which is again also in this case wait for the future that you have created. Well, yes, that you have created here to be ready, basically. So this is the blocking point for the first thread. At some point, basically, in your second thread, you can set the promise value, which means basically that you can say within the second thread that your result is, that your result is, read, is ready, whatever it means. This, uh, this call to the set method basically automatically will make a call to, let's say, automatically send a signal for, to the first thread that in this case knows that the future is ready, that it can continue the execution, basically, and it can access the result of your calculation, or in general, the shared state between the future and the promise. Also, in this case, you don't have to forget to join the new thread that you have created for the execution of, uh, let's say, the task associated with your promise. In this case, if you have a look to the code, always for the same example, the situation is the following one. Here we are creating this promise object. This is a template class which has, as 
template parameter, the type that basically you are setting within your shared state. In this case, we are using this function, and in this function, we are setting exactly the same, uh, the same type, basically. Once that you have created the instance of the, of the promise, you can get the future associated to it here. Then here you create a new task, sorry, a new thread, and this thread will be the one responsible for, let's say, for, to do some, for doing something with your promise, which is in this case just setting the value here. So here we have a new thread that starts the execution, and in the next line, the main thread starts to wait for the future to be ready. When, you're, when your first thread within this function makes the call to set value, automatically there is a, the first thread is notified for the future, let's say for the, state, for the new status of the future, the, which is now ready, and so that it can start, uh, it can start again the execution of these like, calls, basically. And at this point here, again, you have to join or to detach the new thread that you've created for the execution, let's say, of the task assigned with the, with the promise, basically. Any question? This is quite similar again to the packaged task. Okay, as I told you, the, the workflow is practically similar, is very similar to the one or to the, or the packaged task. And it is important to remember that also in this case, basically, if something went wrong here within the, the task assigned to the future or to the packaged task, the exception, is, an exception is stored in the shared state instead of the value of, the, of your calculation of your task, basically. And then we will see what this means in this slide, basically. So let's have a look to this case. In this case, the task is described by this uh, square function my square function basically that um, takes a double value in input and makes a check and just to see if, can, if uh, the, the square root can be calculated. Other, if this is can be done, basically it will return the value of the square root of the provided value. Otherwise, it, it will throw an exception. So in the main function, we are creating a future, making a call to async. As before, we pass an input as an execution, as a task to be executed by the thread, the MySQRT function and we provide an input value which is minus one. So in this case, of course, we will go to this line, but still in the main function, we can just ask for the, for the future associated, for the, let's, sorry, in the main, we can still ask for the future to be ready with this function, so the first thread will wait at this point. In the second thread that is executed after the call of our async function, there is a thr the throne of the exception, but the, when this happens, basically, it is like if this, the value of the calculation is ready, basically, so the first thread is notified for the, because the future is now ready, but, and with this function, basically, you can access not only the result, but only the exception if it is present, like in this case. This means that, basically, you can do something like this. Of course, if you do, sorry, back of one slide, if you just to try to do something like this, you will not get the double here because here this get function will return, will return the double, the, the exception thrown. So this is not a good strategy, but what you can do is just to add this try catch block, basically, so that you can put on this part here. At some point, if, there is a, if the exception is thrown in the, during the execution of the second thread, you can access that, ex that exception here in the catch block so that it allows you to control the execution of the code. And of course, when this, when this exception is thrown, nothing bad happens, let's say, to the, to the execution of your thread. Everything will continue gracefully, and you can catch the exception. You will not get an error from that second thread because something wrong happened. You may mean that you can control the flow on your, uh, of your problem. The same is true also for the package task case. So it is exactly the same, same function. Also, in this case, you will get uh, an, error, an exception because you are using this uh, negative value in input for the calculation of the square root. But also, in this case, you can catch the exception. There is only one main difference here, and this is a question for you. Oh, no, this is no longer a question because I provide the answer. <laughs> OK, the, question is, the point is, of course, that in this case, you have to remember to, to join the thread of execution that you have created when you have provided the package task to the constructor of the thread, of course. And almost the same things is true also 
for the promise case, the only difference is that in the, in the promise case you have to manually set basically the exception. With promises, with the promise you have the both two, you have two methods. The first method is set value, that is the one that you have already seen, that gives you the possibility to set the value of, uh, say, let's say, the result of your calculation or whatever. And then you have also the set exception method that gives you the possibility to say that something went wrong during the execution of the task associated, associated with the promises. But for the first thread, basically, the situation is always the same. You can use the try-catch block to get the exception. I think that we are almost uh, at the end. Just one slide that is something that we already said uh, yesterday about the, let's say, the interaction between the smart pointers and the threads. So as we have already said, basically the only protection that you have in the smart pointer is about the update of the counters, which is a critical operation so that if you're using this smart pointers with, the, with the threads, basically you can be sure that there will not be a data race with the update of the counters of shared, of shared and weak pointers, but there is no protection for the access to the managed resource. So basically you can modify your memory allocation using all the threads all together in a concurrent way, so you don't have any protection. And then the last slide is a quick summary about the other possible multi-threading solution. It's very quick. Description, basically you can you already have a C++ support, uh, parallelism support uh, in the standard library for the algorithm and uh, some numerical, and numerical algorithm, basically, like reduction and, and so on. And it is based on thread. Another possibility is the boost thread library, which is basically the primary model that has been used for the development of C++ threads, basically. Another case is represented by the Intel threading building block blocks, sorry, that is basically a task-based parallel programming library, which means that uh, in this case you can avoid, let's say, to manage uh, all the stuff related to thread creation, creation, join, attach, and so on, because you can basically describe the task to be performed in parallel in a, an abstract way. There is, of course, OpenMP that you already know. And another possibility is HPX. That is something that some of you will see in the next two days. For the, during the course on HPX, so I don't say anything about this since <laughs> you will get a lot of information from John. And yes, I think that this one was my last slide. Yes. So, do you have any question? Yes. So can you connect a future to another future to another future to another future to make like a array of futures or I don't know, a DAG, so you can basically run things, one test that waits to another one that waits to another one, so you can have basically all the program flow in threads? I, I think so. I have to try to write the code because I'm not sure. <laughs> but well, in the current standard, um, there should be something like this. Uh, the, in the next one, there will be a lot of more of that, like you wait all if uh, on a sequence of uh, futures and continuation threads. So instead of doing the gap, you just continue doing some other work. And, and you can do async something, then something else, then something else, etc. cetera. And uh, HPX is actually an implementation of that idea, which is already, which is currently already available. Uh, plus, there are being proposed other even keywords to do the waiting in, in waiting on uh, function arguments. So the function will start when the arguments will be ready or something like this. Uh, right now, I, I, I don't remember exactly what is the current status of the, of the standard. You know, we can try now. So. <laughs> Other questions? No, I don't have exercises on this. I have all the examples. But oh, of course, if you want to have a look, there are all the, the snippets that are on the on the slides are also present in the repository in the, under the the solution part. Should I say that? Because, yeah.